everything was in a hurry. In fact, my employers recently took over a much smaller company that had just recently run aground. I believe that the company probably got everything on the cheap from the bankruptcy trustee. Despite the fact that my own employer has been very successful in recent months and completely overwhelmed with work, our management was in a bit of a panic to get their new acquisition into operation and to keep everything running tip-top. For this purpose, our group was sent there in order to reorient the personnel and monitor the installation of our company's systems. In short, complete chaos reigned for a couple of weeks. We had little time to plan anything, and almost everything was done on the fly. Up to replacing the computer network with a new one due to the insufficient scope of the old one and adding all the necessary wiring. Long story short, the ten of us ran around like mad for days and literally had planning meetings in our hotel bar most nights to plan what we needed to do the next day. All of us lived no more than an hour away by train, but most evenings we all stayed in town for these much-needed nightly meetings. One or two members of the team managed to sneak home on the odd night to see their wives and families, but who we could allow to sneak away depended on what happened that day and, most importantly, the next morning. Anyway, feeling pretty exhausted, I sat in the hotel bar for about half an hour, waiting for the rest of the team to show up when she walked into the living room. Sherry was one of the computer geeks, hired by the specialty company, helping set up computer systems and train staff on how to use them. And boy, did she take me by surprise when I realized who exactly had entered the bar. Sherry was definitely not like the nerdy girl I knew so well who spent her day teaching our new hires how to use our company's systems. Gone was the baggy calf-length sweater skirt and glasses, replaced by a seductively short skirt and a seductively well-fitting silk blouse. She did not look around or assess the situation, as might have been expected. Sherry simply sat on the bar stool and ordered a drink. I decided that she was waiting for someone and apparently I was wondering which of my married colleagues was going to turn from the straight path onto the narrow path. Okay, I admit it. I bolted from behind my desk and very quickly slid onto the stool next to Sherry. Hey, beautiful, what is a cute girl like you doing in a place like this? I asked in the sexiest voice I could muster. Sherry turned to look in my direction, I guess intending to give me an angry look, and most likely tell me where I might go. But then she recognized me. Oh God, Steve, stop being such a fool. What are you doing here? She grinned. I live here, Sherry, I said, motioning for the bartender to put her drink on my tab. Hey, I asked you first anyway. Meeting John, one of those electrician guys, to go to dinner. He lives in the city and will pick me up here. I thought you computer worms were all staying in Conant. Yes. But John doesn't need to know about that, does he? She winked. Besides, the fewer people who know I go on dates, the better. I don't date work colleagues from my own company. This leads to too many complications. Oh, so that's why you hide your advantages in the office? I don't understand how I should perceive this. I think I'll take it as a compliment. That's definitely a compliment, Sherry. About your appearance now, as you sit here, and about your skill as a camouflage expert in action. Lord, you're unrecognizable, girl. Poor John getting here will experience the greatest shock of his life. She smiled. Most of the people I teach to work with our systems are men, Steve. Let's just say that they take instructions much better when they're staring at a monitor rather than trying to sneak a peek at my God-given assets. Well, Steve, now you know the secret to my success in business. Yes. It was damn unexpected when I realized that you were sitting here. Oh, men, don't feed me this, Steve. I bet you've been watching my every move while I've been here, and that it took you more than a little time to look up at my face. Yes, it is true, I admit, and who could blame me? Sherry, you are a wonderful example of your gender. What a pity that you don't meet with your colleagues, I grinned. Steve... You were always charming, even as a fan in the office. But remember, you don't work for the same employer as me, so technically we're not co-workers. What a charming idea, Sherry. Except for one fly in the ointment, I'm married. Damn, 
just when I thought I was going to get lucky, she grinned. And yet, if you ever get tired of family life, you know my work number. We must have joked in this manner for about 20 minutes before Sherry's boyfriend finally appeared, and after he had recovered from the shock, they left together. I bought myself another drink and then went back to my table in the corner to wait for my colleagues. I don't know, probably 10 or 20 minutes later I went to the toilet. While I was there, another guy came. Nice girl, he commented. Sorry? I asked, not entirely sure that I heard him correctly. It's always a little awkward when a complete stranger starts talking to you in the men's room. You just don't know what their motives are. But I tried to remain polite. That young lady you talked to at the bar, she's a pretty girl, the man clarified. Yes, that's true, isn't it? In town on business? He asked when I started washing my hands. Yes, we are opening a new branch. Married? Yes, but why do you ask? Oh, just thinking. Married men away from home should be careful who is watching them when they talk to pretty girls in hotel bars. By that time, the guy was washing his hands, and I was drying mine with a hairdryer. There was something about him that confused me on a regular basis. I was trying to figure out if he was some kind of pervert trying to pick me up, or, more unlikely, a pimp advertising the business for his girls. Are you hinting at something? Yes, that this week you sat in a bar three nights. And every time, there was this little asshole in the other corner. Didn't you notice him? No. And I don't understand what you're trying to say at all? The moment you started talking to this young lady, he started fiddling with his phone. And what's more, when you go up to your room in the evening, he goes out into the lobby and hangs out there until well after midnight. By that time, we were already leaving the toilet, and the guy said that he couldn't say anything more at the moment. He thought that the dumbass hiding in the corner might have noticed that he noticed him. He asked for my cell phone number and said he would call in a few minutes, then walked out of the hotel's main entrance. Frustrated, I returned to my seat at the bar, still trying to figure out why I had given my cell phone number to a complete stranger. True to my word, a few minutes later, my cell phone rang. It was this guy, and he told me to just sit quietly and listen. Then he told an almost incredible story. He did a lot of back and forth, but the gist of what he told me was that he had recently been set up by his now ex-wife. He explained that while on a business trip, he innocently struck up a conversation with an attractive young woman sitting in the hotel bar. During their conversation, it turned out that she went into the bar to hide from her abusive ex-husband, whom she managed to notice on the street before he could see her. It never occurred to my trusting new friend that sitting on a stool at the bar was not a good place to hide. If he hadn't been so captivated by her attractive appearance and story, he would probably have realized that it would have been better for her to choose a seat in a dark corner. Anyway, she pointed out the marks on her face and arms that led him to believe that someone had recently been cruel to her, and hence he swallowed her story hook, line, and damn sinker. She then suddenly announced that her husband would be coming into the bar and ran out the back door. Fearing for her safety, my new friend followed her and quickly discovered her trying to hide in an alcove in the hallway. He offered to rent her a room for the night where she could hide, but she insisted that she could not enter the hotel lobby because her ex-husband would likely see her. Yes, even I guessed what would happen next. After much discussion, it was decided that the young woman would take his key and hide in his room, while my new friend booked her a private room, after which he will give her the key and she can hide there for the night, which is essentially what happened. The moment he gave the young woman her key, she hugged him and kissed him on the cheek in gratitude before he escorted her to her room and then immediately returned to his. The next morning, he did not see the young woman and forgot the whole incident as a slightly expensive trip into the realm of old-fashioned chivalry. Feeling quietly pleased with himself, he thought that the incident was over, but that was not the case. A few days later, while unpacking his suitcase, his wife discovered women's underwear stuffed at the bottom. Then all hell broke loose. A few days later, he was served with divorce papers, and from them he learned that a young lady had admitted to having sex with him in a hotel room that evening. Moreover, 
there were photographs of him and a young woman in a bar, entering or leaving his hotel room. He claimed that the whole farce was orchestrated by his wife and her lover, who he later found out was her boss at the place where she worked, before they had children. Although he had no evidence of this fact, nor that his wife was intimate with this guy until their divorce began and they officially separated. It was all too cruel, buddy, he said. That bastard was in the house occupying her the night the judge issued the separation order. And I was forbidden to go near her because the cow claimed that I was threatening her with violence. Now she has a house because I have to provide housing for the children until they reach adulthood. I'm burdened with her maintenance, child support, and payments for this damn house. And all this time this asshole is sleeping in it with my ex-wife. I can understand your obvious disappointment, my friend. But what does this have to do with me? I asked when he finally fell silent. Are you sitting at the same corner table that you and your friends have been using all week? He asked. Yes. Then try not to show it too much, but in the corner, at the other end of the wall, there should be a young guy sitting alone. I think he's almost hidden from you by that damn huge triffid plant. It was as if I happened to glance in the direction indicated by my new free end. Of course, there was someone behind this plant, but I couldn't see who it was. Yes, I think I see him. Well, I don't know what his game is, but this little shit is watching you, my friend. I'm just giving you a hint, because you seem like a decent enough guy, and I'd hate to see you get screwed over like I was. Well, that's very kind of you, my friend. But I am not going to stray from the righteous path. I didn't mean to either, my friend, and in fact, I didn't but that didn't stop me from being set up. For some reason, your wife must think you walk to the left when you're away from home. Never. In fact, I'm very rarely away from home. This is my first trip in more than a year, I said. Then it's quite strange, don't you think? Otherwise, why would this guy follow you? Follow me? Yes, sure. He's been following you at the hotel for the last three evenings. Nonsense, my friend. It must be pure coincidence that we both return to the hotel at about the same time every evening. He doesn't live in a hotel. Just after one in the morning, he goes home. Look, I can prove it to you. Finish your drink and then leave the hotel. Walk down to the Plume of Feathers, just a couple of hundred meters or so. There are many entrances, so if he's following you, as I assume, he'll have to follow you into the pub to make sure you don't sneak out through one of the others. If you stand right next to the bar, you can see him enter in the mirror. I walked past my boys on my way out of the hotel, telling them I'd be right back. It wasn't until I was about halfway to the Plum of Feathers that I began to wonder if I was doing the right thing. After all, there's a distinct possibility that I'm setting myself up for robbery or something like that. There was no one around on the way. I made it safely to Plum and ordered a pint of beer. Sure enough, the young fool I had chanced a quick glance at as I left the hotel bar, went in, and bought himself a drink at the far end of the bar. Then he sat down at the far end of the hall, from where he could freely watch me. A couple of minutes later, my cell phone rang again. Am I right or wrong? Right, I agreed. He positioned himself against the wall, trying to pretend he wasn't watching me. What are you going to do? I'll be damned if I know. Well, just don't do anything stupid, like, don't let him know you noticed him, or don't flirt with attractive girls. Let me think, and I'll call you back tomorrow. But what if he, you know, plans to rob me or something? No, he's not one of those. I guess he's a college student making some money working for some shady private detective agency. He, of course, has no idea how to secretly spy on anyone. I didn't notice him. You, my friend, are too much like me. The thought of going left doesn't cross your mind, and so you have no reason to constantly look over your shoulder. Here is your red-haired friend. He is in action and is always looking around. I'm a little surprised he didn't notice your shadow. Yeah, okay. My red-haired co-worker he was talking about is actually the office Casanova, and at first I suspected Sherry was at the hotel to meet him. Having finished my pint of beer and plume, I headed back to the hotel along a somewhat winding route that took me along the river. I hoped it looked like I was out for an evening exercise to get some fresh air. Returning to the hotel, the guys asked where I had disappeared,
but did not insist on finding out. We then proceeded to review the office plans and discuss the expected work schedule for the next day. Later, leaving the bar and on the way to my room, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that someone was again hiding behind that damn plant. Are you okay? My new friend asked when he called me the next day. Yeah, I'm fine. I still can't understand why this kid has to follow me. Do you want to know? Yes, I think I want to. Someone must be paying this scoundrel, and if my wife is wasting my hard-earned money, I will be very angry. Okay, leave it to me. There are also a couple of divorced husbands working in the office where I was assigned. I'll have to stay out of sight because the bastard might recognize me, but we think we have a foolproof plan where they can grab the son of a bitch and ask him what he's doing without letting on that, you know, he's spying on you. It will be difficult, won't it? No. The boys are planning to deceive him, saying that they were also hired to watch you, and they will be harsh with the guy. Damn. He's just a kid, and he'll probably wet his pants. In any case, they will promise him that if he tells them everything honestly, they will not tell whoever hired him that he failed the job. With any luck, he would rather keep his mouth shut than risk losing his employer. It was agreed that I would do another exercise at about the same time as the night before. Only this time I will head to the river along a very specific route that leads through dark places. I admit, entering into this alliance, I again wondered if I had been deceived into getting into something unpleasant. Halfway down the alley I noticed two dark figures hiding in the shadows, and was somewhat relieved to hear one of them say, Keep walking. He's about fifty meters behind you. Then I continued my walk and nothing else of note happened that I knew of, and as I headed to my room that evening, someone was hiding behind the plant again. Well, it worked, but it doesn't make much sense, said the voice of my new friend when I answered my cell phone just after midnight. Oh, so he spokey. The boy spoke so lewdly that they couldn't shoot him up. Well, they seemed like big guys to me. In the pitch black, at this time of night, everyone looks like a big guy, my friend. But you just won't believe this, I personally can't figure it out. Your little tail should pick you up from the office every evening. He should watch you until midnight. And then, making sure that you went to bed, he could remove the surveillance and go home. And it's all? Yes, he works part-time at a local detective agency, as we expected, but he's not really interested in what you're doing or where you're going, unless it's to the train station. The railway station? Yes, well, you know those things that ride on rails. Yes, okay, that's how I got here. There was no point in dragging the car here. Well, the most interesting thing is that if you do go to the station, he should see what train you take. If it's a northbound train, he can get off and go home. If you get on a southbound train, well, then he has a cell phone number that he should call immediately. To the south, you say? Yes, I would assume that you live on the south coast, my friend? Yes. But why would you want to get on a northbound train? My sister lives there, about half an hour's drive from here. Hmm. Then I guess this is bad news, isn't it? Yes. Do you have a number for the guy to call? I'll send you a text message as soon as we finish this conversation. Thank you. What are you going to do, my friend? I think I'll pay my sister a visit tomorrow evening. Do you need any support? That would be very kind of you. I have no idea what I might be getting myself into. Write to me the departure time of the train you are traveling on tomorrow, and we will meet you at the next station along the way. Oh, and my two friends. If you see them anywhere, ignore them, you know. They are complete strangers to you, and it will be safer for everyone if everything remains the same. Is this really necessary? These are two very evil ex-husbands, my friend. All you have to do is give them a nod and they'll be only too happy to take care of whatever you need once we're safely on the train back here. I'm sorry? Currently, CCTV cameras are installed at all stations, my friend. Almost ideal when an alibi is required. I didn't know the phone number my tail was supposed to call. It was a cell number anyway, so it probably wouldn't lead to anything even if I tried to trace it. The next evening, having traveled one station north, I changed trains going south and joined my new friend one station from where I had started my journey. 
He reported that the young man watched my train depart north and then left the station, presumably to go to bed early. I saw no sign of the two large dark figures I had passed in the alley the previous evening, and my new friend made no mention of them. Clearly, we discussed what I might find when I got to my house and what we would do if no one was home. My wife didn't say she was going anywhere, so we decided that she would wait for the guest at home. Well, there's always the chance that I'll call to chat later in the evening. I already did this once earlier that week, and looking back, I thought my wife was a little distracted. She admitted that she was in the middle of a television series and that she had turned off the sound when the phone rang and that she was trying to follow the broadcast by turning on the closed captioning function on the television. Constance always watched those stupid soap operas on TV, so at that moment I accepted her explanation. By now I wasn't so sure. I was actually racking my brain trying to remember what else I heard in the background during the conversation. Some barely audible sound haunted me, and a couple of times I thought that perhaps Constance was covering the microphone with her hand. She even giggled at one point in our conversation, but I assumed she was laughing at something in her soap. I looked around, but at my home station, only the two of us got off the train. My new friend must have noticed this. Don't worry, they're already here. We arrived earlier by car. As we headed towards my house, my companion began talking to himself. For a few seconds, I thought he was crazy, and then I realized that he had one of those Bluetooth devices in his ear that allows you to do this. Apparently, he was talking to two dark shadows. He said that it would be better for us to stay somewhere for a while. Constance is still alone, but waiting for someone. When I asked why he was so sure, he said that about five minutes ago she opened the attached garage door and took our car outside. It looks like her visitor intends to stay all night, he commented. We spent a little time looking at shop windows in an area of town where we couldn't be seen from the road until my companion was told the game had started. Then we headed to my house. My companion prevented me from rushing in like the proverbial bull in a china shop. He noted that tonight was probably not the first night that Constance had had a visitor, so there was little point in closing the stable door after the horse had bolted. We needed to give them enough time to really and truly figure out whatever it was they were going to get into, so we can get the evidence I'll need when it comes to trial. Obviously, my companion has more experience in these matters than I do, so I followed his advice. We hung around the back garden for about 20 minutes before my impatience got the better of me after which I crept to the back window of the living room. Luckily, those curtains that Constance was so excited to find had shrunk a little after the wash, and I never had time to take out the stepladder again and adjust the drawstring on them so that they closed completely in the middle. I actually never would have thought that Constance was capable of such a thing. She was completely naked and kneeling next to an equally naked Tony Copland. He was nothing less than one of our local councillors and a potential candidate for his party for parliament at the next general election. Our current MP has already announced that he is going to resign. It is clear that Constance was committing an act that a certain ex-president of the United States described as no sexual relations. I somewhat disagree. By the way, I only found out that this idiot's name was Tony Copland because Constance was delivering flyers for his political party before the last local elections. Constance wasn't a party follower or anything like that, but she had inexplicably been involved in the latest local election campaign. From this point on, I wondered whether Constance's affair with Copland developed because of her work in the party during this election, or whether her sudden interest in local politics and elections was a result of her affair with Copland. I must admit that I will probably never get an answer to this question. I suppose I was still pondering this question when my companion pulled me away from the window. As we walked further away from the house, my companion handed me a small video camera complete with a strap that I could hang around my neck. He explained that when we entered the house, I should keep the camera pointed at Copeland and Constance for as long as possible. But if Copeland attacks me, I have to let go of the camera and defend myself. He reminded that the camera would continue to record even if it was just hanging on a cord. And no matter what I said or did once we entered the house, under no circumstances should I have threatened any of the perpetrators with physical harm. 
If he attacks you, I don't care if you break that bastard's head, but don't lay your hands on him first. I will point my camera at you the entire time to prove that you did not attack him, and I will try to keep it on both of them at all times. Two cameras? I asked. Yes, this is my business selling video cameras wholesale, didn't I tell you? You didn't tell me anything about yourself. I don't even know your name. It might be best if you decide you want the boys to get busy later. After sneaking into the garage and slowly deflating all the tires on Copeland's car, we walked through the fire door into the kitchen. From there, we could see and record what happened in the living room where the Copelands had sex with Constance. It took all the influence of my companion to help me maintain my composure not to burst into the room and kick his ass. How the hell Constance never noticed that we were standing there recording the scene is beyond me. Copeland said something to Constance about how he couldn't hold back any longer and started having sex with her as hard as he could. Somewhat strangely, I thought, Constance told him to slow down and seemed to conclude that he was hurting her by acting that way. Their conversation didn't really make much sense because Copeland punctuated almost every word he spoke with two words, fucking bitch. While Constance kept saying, oh shit. Copeland had been doing this for several minutes when the cell phone on the coffee table rang. This made him stop having sex with Constance for a second and look at the ringing phone. After thinking a little, he rolled over the sofa, pulling Constance along with him so that she was on top and ordered her to continue having sex picking up the phone that was still ringing. Constance, much to my surprise, complied. In fact, I have to imagine that Constance is more pleased to be on top. Many times she performed in the same way on me. However, I could never remember her being so indifferent in this position. The strange thing was that by this point, Constance was looking into the mirror on the wall behind our sofa and almost directly into my companion's eyes and mine in our reflections in the damn thing. Only God knows where her thoughts were. Copeland put the phone to his ear and said, Hello? Then things started to get comical. I, of course, could only hear one side of the conversation. I have no idea what the caller was telling him, but I kind of got the point. Where did you get this number? demanded Copeland. No, I don't have anything that I would like to make a statement about in any newspaper. How dare you, young man? I... If you make such accusations in your newspaper, young man, I'll take your damn job away from you. Constance stopped moving and looked down at Copeland. She must have sensed something in his tone. Or maybe what the reporter was telling him suddenly put Copeland out of the mood to have sex, and it affected a certain part of his anatomy. Listening here... I visited a local resident on official council business. Helping is part of my responsibilities as an advisor. It's none of your business, young man. Her husband knows very well that I'm here tonight. At this point in Copeland's telephone conversation, Constance's gaze suddenly returned to the mirror on the wall, and an expression of horror appeared on her face. Steve! Oh, God, no! Steve! She howled at the top of her voice. Constance's sudden scream caught Copeland by surprise, and he looked up at her. I can only assume that he realized that she was looking at her reflection in the mirror because he moved his upper body to the side so that he could see my companion and me. Until this point in my life, I hadn't seen real fear in someone's eyes very many times. But that evening it was fear that I saw in Copeland's eyes. You know, I don't know whether he turned off the call on his cell phone or not but I do know that in a panic, he pushed Constance off him with such force that she fell to the floor, breaking the coffee table with her head and briefly losing consciousness. I have to say that I have never seen anyone put their pants on so quickly. Copeland then found his jacket and threw it on. My companion shouldered me further into the living room while we continued to film Copeland hurrying to leave the house. I later realized that my companion had led us out of the kitchen doorway to clear a path for Copeland to retreat to the garage where his car was parked. With boots in one hand and underwear in the other, Copeland rushed past us into the garage. Soon I heard him shout, Bastards! Meanwhile, my companion told me to check on Constance, but at the same time warned me to keep the camera aimed at her and he would follow Copeland.
I guessed from Copeland's scream that he had discovered that all four tires of his car were flat. Anyway, I heard the garage door open and he tried to drive away. By that time, I was already next to the newly conscious Constance, who, having regained consciousness, sat up, looked into my eyes, and then quickly fainted. In the process, she once again hit her head hard on the floor. From my point of view, Constance didn't seem to be having a very good evening. I decided that I had better get Constance medical attention, so with the camera still trained on Constance's naked body, I went to our land lean and dialed three nines, only to be told that an ambulance and police were on their way. Indeed, I heard the sirens even before I hung up the phone. In fact, quite strangely, when the paramedic burst into the living room, I was still standing and filming Constance, who by this time was semi-conscious. Is it time to leave, my friend? My companion returned and gently pushed me towards the door. He also placed sunglasses on my nose and a huge felt hat on my head, which he pulled tightly over the sunglasses. I have no idea where he got this item and was somewhat surprised that he himself was now dressed in a similar way. I realized why when we left the house through the garage. A camera crew and several reporters were waiting to pounce on us. They bombarded us with too many questions to answer while my companion led me to a waiting taxi. Some other stranger stood between the newspaper men and me and my companion, continuing to repeat, My client cannot make any statements at this time. As the taxi took us to the station, I looked at my companion. What you told me was all bullshit, I asked him. No, my wife set me up, as I said. Although her lawyer... Well, he was a real asshole. You just met him this evening. Copeland? Yeah, Copeland. Then last week, a friend of mine who works in the detective business said that he had been contacted by a certain Tony Copeland who wanted to keep an eye on you. Well, my friend didn't like the way the job smelled. It didn't make sense to him, and Copeland wouldn't explain what it was, so he turned it down. But a friend, knowing the hostility I felt towards Copeland, warned me of his desire to be informed if you showed any desire to return home unexpectedly. Well, it was pretty obvious, wasn't it? It doesn't take a genius to put two and two together as to what Copland's performance is. Sorry about the press, but I wanted to make sure that Copland's political aspirations would come to an abrupt end. Hopefully it won't do much good for his legal business either. In fact, once they get their hands on the bastard, I'm sure the media will forget about you and your wife pretty quickly. There's still plenty of juicy shit in Copland's past for them to sink their teeth into. We were on the train back north when my companion reported that Constance was in the local hospital. A micro-crack in the skull, his interlocutor suggested. He then asked if I would like something to be done with Copland when the police were done with him. I looked at him with a question in my eye and he explained that Copeland had found it difficult to drive with four flat tires and had crashed into at least three parked cars and ended up parking in a storefront. Copeland was last seen being driven away in the back of a police van. My companion, who was apparently still in contact and receiving messages from eyewitnesses at the scene on his cell phony, was a little hazy about the exact reason for Copeland's arrest. He simply called it a traffic violation. It seemed reasonable to me at the time. Driving a car with four flat tires certainly cannot be legal. I later learned from television and newspaper reports that Copeland panicked when, after opening the roller garage, he saw people from television and the press gathered outside. He was naked in the garage, and my companion was blocking Copeland's access to the door close button. So, panicking... Copeland jumped into his car and drove away. Or, more precisely, he tried to leave. The brief description I read in the press stated that his car was certainly on the road, but hit a TV crew van as it pulled out of my driveway and numerous other parked vehicles as it drove down our street. Then, as Copeland tried to turn onto the main road, he apparently collided with a passing truck. It turned out that the collision with a larger vehicle gave Copeland's car the momentum it needed to crash into the storefront. What a shame that our taxi went in a different direction that evening. I would really like to see the meat grinder with my own eyes. During our journey, my companion reported that this evening would probably be our last meeting.
but he also said that if everything went according to plan, I would hear from him sometime in the future. He again apologized for the awkwardness with publicity, but said that he needed something spectacular that would set the dogs off the chain. Many months passed before I understood what he was talking about. I'll come back to this later. On one of the stages, when our train was crossing a bridge over the river, my companion threw the mobile phone he was using out of the window, telling me that I would no longer be able to contact him through it, like no one else. Keep the video camera for yourself. I have a lot more. He grinned. What about recording in the second? I'm sure you have enough of what you need on the chip in that camera, Steve. I have plans for these records, and I may have to stir the brew a little. But don't worry, your wife's face won't be in the newspapers. Who cares? I said. You, my friend. And I'm sorry that this will happen. No man likes the idea of everyone knowing that his wife is a cheater who's been cheating behind his back for God knows how long. It's not good for our egos, my friend. I can assure you. Such is human nature. My companion got off the train a couple of stops before me. He shook my hand, apologized again for the publicity, and any other consequences that might unintentionally arise in the future, and assured me that he would do everything possible to minimize them, but did not specify what he thought might happen. Happen. His last act was to give me a business card and tell me that it belonged to a lawyer who was near my house. He is a good person and you can trust him. I will have to use it for my divorce if I decide to go through with it, and for any other unforeseen circumstances. Then the train left the station, and I was never destined to meet him in person again. But still I received news from him in a roundabout way, and saw his face again. The night front desk attendant caught me as I was entering my hotel, and handed me a package marked urgent. I took her with me to a bar where, to be honest, I planned to get really drunk. Who wouldn't do this under such and such circumstances? When I tore the wrapping paper off the package at the bar, I discovered that it contained the packaging box for the small video camera that was now in my pocket and a printed note. Basically, the note told me not to get drunk. I had to go to my room and make at least one copy of the file from the camera's memory card on my laptop, and then several more on whatever media I had on hand. I was also suggested not to keep all the copies made and the original in the same place. After drinking the scotch I ordered and another glass on top, I did as the note instructed, burning one copy of the file to a DVD, which I then took out and put in the hotel safe. At the same time I sent the second one to my sister. I was only able to make two copies because I only had a couple of blank DVDs and CDs in my laptop case. I suppose it was morbid curiosity that made me watch the show again before I put my head down and tried to get some sleep. However, he was not entirely successful in this regard. God only knows what I looked like the next day, but everyone in the office tried to stay away from me if they could. Around noon, two plainclothes police officers came to the office wanting to have a quiet conversation with me. I took them to an empty office where we were alone for a while. They explained that there was a slight disagreement over how Constance, who claimed to have no memory of the previous evening, suffered a skull fracture, even though it was only a hairline fracture. From the way they spoke, I gathered that someone had suggested that I had been rather cruel the last time he saw Constance and me together. Of course, they didn't say who made the claim, but it wasn't hard for me to guess. They refused to confirm or deny that it was Copeland. It took me a little while to find the right moment in the recording, and I asked if they would like a copy. They actually asked for the original recording, but I said I wasn't going to let the thing out of my possession. They finally accepted the copy I made while they were waiting on a DVD. I swiped from one of the computer guys. While my laptop was doing its thing with the DVD, I arranged for one of the girls to bring us some tea and the officers, and I sort of struck up a friendly conversation about the previous few days. That is if you can ever have a friendly conversation with the police officer on duty. They showed great interest in my mysterious friend. But I think it was just curiosity on their part. The videotape proved that he had not harmed Constance either. In fact, the officers were wondering if there was any possibility of pressing charges against Copeland, since he was the one who had alienated Constance quite badly. They said they would ask the Crown Prosecution Service people to look into it thoroughly. 
I think they were just mildly interested in who had a grudge against Copeland and why. They said I should be careful and suggested that Copeland was a fairly powerful lawyer. At the same time, as if to draw the line, they had reason to suspect that Copeland did not entirely comply with elementary ethical standards in all his actions. You mean, for example, in sex with other people's wives? I noticed. Oh, and a lot of other things, Steve, we just can't deal with this bastard. Let's just say that, unofficially, he is on many police lists of persons of interest. But if you don't mind me saying that you seem to be taking things a little lightly, Steve. What else am I supposed to do, officer? Lose my temper and start beating my chest. If I had behaved the way you thought you expected me to, wouldn't you now be leading me to your car in handcuffs? I asked. Yes, Steve, I think that would be the case. The officer smiled in response. In my experience, officer, once the goulash has been dropped and all the shit is falling on you, the best thing you can do is laugh, or at least try to do so. It actually confuses the minds of those who would wish you misfortune. Both officers laughed and then shook my hand as they left. Later that day, I went out to find a working phone booth and called the lawyer my friend suggested. He was waiting for my call and simply asked if I was going to get a divorce right away. When I said that I had few alternatives, if I wanted to be able to hold my head high in public in the future, he simply said he would sort it out and then asked if he could send one of his employees to visit me later that day. She needed to take all the information about Constance and me. I asked if I should write the woman a check to reserve his services, but he advised that that had already been taken care of. Don't ask why, Steve, but you will never receive a bill for my services. Someone we've both met intends to put the cost of all of this on Copland. You know, he comes from a very wealthy family and he's made a lot of money himself. Just not all of it strictly legal. That evening, the whole group was waiting for me at the bar, apparently hoping that I had calmed down enough to be ready to talk about the previous evening. Oh, by then they had all already looked through the afternoon papers, I found it funny that since the morning I had not seen any of the newspapers of that day scattered around the offices. I gave them the short version that I went into the house and found Constance cheating with Tony Copland. They asked about everything that was covered in the press, but I denied that I knew anything about how it all happened. Hey, it was true, I really had no idea about anything. It was probably about nine in the evening when my new lawyer, extremely attractive but also very efficient, I don't know if she was a partner or an assistant, arrived at the hotel to see me. We went to the hotel library to talk privately. The first thing Miss Clarkson told me was that she had already spoken to Constance and advised her to find a lawyer herself as soon as she was discharged from the hospital. It is much easier for your own lawyer to explain to the client that he has nothing to rely on. Do you know that your wife doesn't want a divorce? I know. Now look at all these text messages and voicemails she sent me today. I answered, showing her my mobile phone. Did she try to call you? Yes, but I'm pretty busy here. I suspect that this is exactly what he and Copeland were counting on. That's about it. Copeland had apparently been hunting her for some time. She claims he only succeeded this week, but, well, in my experience, people tend to be sparing with the truth when it suits them. Well, he would hardly have agreed to have someone follow my movements if he had no reason to believe that he had the opportunity to sleep with Constance. Steve, Miss Clarkson, everyone knows me as Steve. Very good, Steve. But I'm afraid I'm Miss Clarkson to everyone except my fiancé. I imagine he must be very handsome. And courageous, Steve. Believe me. Oh, I believe it, Miss Clarkson. I believe it. She smiled at me for the first time, breaking the business-like expression on her face, but then returned to the reason for her visit. Surprisingly, she already knew almost everything she needed. Ms. Clarkson took a piece of paper from her briefcase and jotted down a list of questions. Constance and my full names, birth dates, our wedding date, and so on. I saw Ms. Clarkson simply placing a check mark next to the correct answers that she had already typed. There were a couple of minor errors, but that's all. Everything was already there, including the value of our house but not the contents of our bank accounts or our savings details. Yes, I myself could hardly remember them, at least in detail. Ms. Clarkson then placed a form in front of me for me to sign. 
It was essentially a contract in which her boss instructed her to act on my behalf regarding Constance, my divorce, and any other legal issues, whether they arose as a result of our divorce or not, until I terminated this contract in writing. Before leaving, Miss Clarkson suggested that I call Constance and talk to her. In fact, I made it clear verbally that I had no intention of forgiving Constance for her actions. She also said that I could find Constance at her sister's house. The press is watching your house. You might find that you'll find a little more peace if you find a different place to stay this weekend. Steve Ms. Clarkson always felt a little awkward calling me by my first name. Oh, by the way, your employers are doing a good job of being rather vague about your whereabouts. I had to wonder who asked them to do this, and more importantly, when. After Miss Clarkson left, and I was veiledly questioned about who my delightful visitor was, I went up to my room to call Constance. Oh, the guys were a little shocked when I said that Miss Clarkson was my lawyer's representative. None of them could get over the fact that she paid me a visit at such a late hour and seemed to ask how much her legal representation would cost me. June, Constance's sister, answered the call, and our conversation was short and concise. All June could think of to say was that she was personally sorry for what happened and hoped we could remain friends. Then she said that she would go and bring the stupid, weak-minded cow. To me, those three words summed up June's feelings about her sister's behavior. About a year later, on my honeymoon in Malta, by coincidence, I ran into June again. The press apparently didn't know where I was by the time I spent the weekend with my sister and her family. My sister and her husband were very understanding and did not push for any details. Hell, they'd probably read about most of them in the papers anyway. On Sunday evening, when I returned to the hotel, I was served with a restraining order. I couldn't understand a damn thing, but Miss Clarkson explained to me over the phony that Copeland had obtained an emergency restraining order prohibiting me from publishing in the press any footage taken on the evening in question or posting it on the internet. Hey, come on, I couldn't make shit sense of all this legal mumbo-jumbo at the best of times, but at least Ms. Clarkson managed to get the gist of it into my thick head. But I didn't do it, and I didn't even intend to, I answered. We know but someone else did it and is still going to do everything they can to discredit Copeland. Oops. Yes, and you can expect to be summoned to appear before a high court judge tomorrow morning. But don't panic. We've got everything covered. Glad to hear that you are not panicking. You pay us for this. What can a high court judge do to me? Send me to prison. Well, yes, but I told you that we have everything under control. On Monday afternoon, I found myself standing in the defendant's seat, face to face with a very irritated judge. I didn't say a word. My lawyers, dressed in wigs and gowns, did all the talking, informing the judge that there was also an anonymous third party who made a recording similar to the one I had, and at the same time. To my slight surprise, the police photo analyst confirmed that the photographs in question were not stills from the recording that I had made. Oh, by the way, the two photographs in question somehow ended up in the hands of the national press. In general, I think that if Copland had done nothing, only less authoritative and sensational publications would have published them. And in the end, they did so. But along with all the other newspapers and media that could lay their paws on the scoundrels. Both photographs featured Tony Copland. In one of them, he looked out from behind Constance's naked body with a surprised expression on his face. The other was putting on trousers, while behind him Constance lay naked on the floor. Constance could not be identified in any of the photographs. The judge seemed to have a hard time believing that I had no idea who my mystery companion was that evening, and he pretty much said as much. However, in the end, he seemed to agree with my arguments and he reminded me that there was a temporary moratorium on the publication of all recordings made in the house on that fateful evening. Then they told me that I was free and could go. Fighting through the crowd of reporters outside the courthouse was a hell of a struggle. Copeland succeeded in obtaining an emergency injunction on the grounds that he was in a private home and argued that he had a reasonable expectation of privacy, or at least words to that effect. 
The newspapers fought vigorously against the injunction, and I strongly suspect that they were assisted by my lawyers. When the case reached a full court hearing a few days later, the judge quickly lifted the injunction. The essence of the judge's decision was that my house was private property, not Copeland's, and that he could not reasonably expect any privacy within its walls, especially in one of the common rooms, and since the people who made the recordings were me and my guest, Copeland had no right to object to their becoming, in whole or in part, in the public domain. Well, I think that's what the judge was saying. Most likely all these machinations did little, except increase public interest in the story, because all the newspapers and television news programs had this as a headline, and I wasn't the only one who expected the two photographs to be printed prominently, and several more that appeared in the following days. Hey, when they were finally cleared in court, the damn headlines and stories attached to those photos were brilliant in my opinion. Under one of them it was written, caught in the act of a crime, on the other, escape of a coward. The accompanying story explained that Copeland was calmly getting dressed while his lover lay unconscious on the floor next to him. However, it was clear that whoever took the footage and released it to the press was very careful about what he was doing. Constance's face was either completely cut out of the frame or was actually blurred out. I guess you could say that after my outburst with the Supreme Court judge, everything went back to normal. I finished my second week in the new office and then returned home. However, I found that I could not stay in the house and temporarily settled in a small hotel near work. Meanwhile, Miss Clarkson called me and said that she had been contacted by a lawyer working for Constance. From what Miss Clarkson told me, I understood that Constance was having a hard time with the press guys. I guess they must have discovered that she was staying at June's house. In any case, Miss Clarkson said that Constance's lawyer said that his client did not want a divorce, but if I insisted, Constance would agree to the terms I proposed. We told him your name is not Hamilton, Miss Clarkson said, giggling. Hamilton? I repeated, having no idea what that was supposed to mean. Damn it, Steve, get on with it. What is the year now? Trafalgar, Nelson, Lady Hamilton. Oh, yes, very funny. I lied. I really couldn't get my head around talking to Miss Clarkson. At any rate, Miss Clarkson said that Constance was in a hurry to get it all over with. Perhaps she thought this would somehow lead to the press leaving her alone. But in fact, I believe the press moved on to other issues long before our divorce proceedings began although in any case it received a small headline on the inside pages of our local press. I agreed that everything should be divided strictly in half, provided that Constance was willing to admit that the only reason for the breakdown of our marriage was her affair, and that she would agree to act as a witness in any further legal action I might take against Copeland. Somewhat surprisingly, Constance's lawyers asked me to agree to appear in court as a witness in a case she herself was pursuing against Copeland. This confused me until Miss Clarkson advised that it was likely a personal injury claim, and that a video of the event, a copy of which had already been sent to Constance's lawyer, would probably be enough for Copeland to settle the case out of court. Okay. I guess he did because I never heard about it again. The house sold very quickly. Well, the market was very good then. Constance came by to pick up the few things she needed, and I put the rest in storage until I found another house I liked. But... I didn't really bother looking for it. Life in a hotel may not seem like much fun, but you get used to it. There's less work, no cooking or anything, and it's cheaper than paying a mortgage. Hey, I even had free parking right downtown. Sometimes strange reporters would track me down, and I would even be willing to talk to them. Either way, they didn't really seem interested in Constance or me. Everyone asked me what I really knew about my mystery friend. I'm afraid I couldn't tell them anything but a couple of them with whom I got on well and who told me in confidence that they thought there was something about Copland that had not yet been revealed and that they thought it must surely concern my mysterious friend. Well, I handed their business cards to Miss Clarkson, although by that time she claimed that she also knew nothing about this man personally. It didn't quite line up with some of the comments she'd made to me earlier when we were dating, but she did use the words, no, personally. 
I don't know, maybe two or even three months have passed since that fateful evening. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, one day I was sitting at my desk, staring at my computer screen as usual, when the desk shook and someone sat on it. I looked to my left and saw a pair of knees covered in gray flannel. Looking further to the left, I noticed that the flannel fabric stretched almost all the way to the pair of Nike sneakers. Looking up again, I came to my senses and saw an oversized blue jumper topped with a shock of ash blonde hair and a pair of giant black horn-rimmed glasses. Hi, handsome. What's a nice gentleman like you doing in a place like this? Sherry asked. Hi, Sherry. Long time no see. What are you doing in this wilderness? I answered. Sherry explained that our company had become one of her employer's largest clients and she was assigned to visit us one day a month, literally to hang out and chat with real workers in various departments, just to see if there was a need for any changes to the program that could make their life easier. So, what can I do for you? I'm happy with everything I have. Yes, you would be the first to tell them upstairs if something didn't suit you. No, Steve, I'm here to collect your debt. I have no idea what expression crossed my face, but it caused Sherry to giggle. Hey, handsome, you owe me dinner. Must? Yes, I definitely should. You said you couldn't invite me to dinner because you were a married man, and from what I read in the papers, it's as if you're not married anymore. Did I say that? Well, not in many words, but that was the gist of what you said in the hotel bar that evening. Was that what happened? By this time, I was trying to keep the confused expression on my face. Come on, Steve, stop fooling around. Uh, I can't remember what you said to me that night. Steve, okay, beauty, I haven't gone anywhere for weeks. It could do me good. Where do you want to go? Oh, nothing special. I have to catch the train home just after nine. This is disappointing. Dinner, I said, Steve, behave yourself. Damn it, why do you beauties always say that? I'll be in the waiting room when you're done, she grinned. Then she slid off my desk and left the department. As before, Sherry's transformation was amazing. When I got off the elevator, there was no one who wasn't looking at her. God, I don't think any man who walked through the waiting room while she was waiting for me could have missed her and most likely would have wanted her waiting for him. The two guards she spoke to were clearly fascinated by Sherry. As I came closer, she moved away from them and took my arm. Where are we going? She asked. First, to my hotel. I have to change clothes. There's no time, handsome. We have less than four hours. My train leaves at nine. But, no buts, Steve. We have a lot to talk about. I agreed, and accompanied by one of the guards, who insisted on carrying Sherry's briefcase, we headed to my car. Sherry's briefcase and briefcase were stowed in the trunk along with mine, and I drove us to an inn not far from town, where I knew food was served all day. We talked a bit and had a leisurely dinner. Sherry did not so much demand as invite me to relieve my soul and speak out. I don't know how it was with Sherry, but I felt that I could talk to her, and I instinctively knew that what I said would not become common knowledge the next day. When I spoke up, Sherry caught me off guard by going on the attack and telling me why she had cheated me out of dinner. Steve, you have to do something about yourself, my friend. All the female staff in the office say that you are not the cheerful guy you used to be. Keep in mind, they all admit that, under the circumstances, they can't blame you. But honestly, they'd like to see some sign that you still have the same Steve in you. I don't understand you, Sherry. Yes, I don't think you see it yourself. Steve, you were always fun to work with. Even I knew it when we worked on the same projects. Four or five times. But even then, we never worked closely together. You see, in your company for a long time, it was almost a standard procedure for all women to report their problems with men to good old Steve from the logistics and planning department. And from what I've heard, some guys have also turned to you for advice about their wives and girlfriends. Did they do that? This is news to me. In any case, even if they did, I no longer have what you might call a good track record in marital relationships, do I? Nonsense, Steve. The reason everyone came to you was because you showed them how to laugh. Well, at least look at things from a funny side and laugh at them. 
Apparently, you were an ace when it came to advising girls about birthday and Christmas gifts for their men, and you advised them to immediately get rid of the hopeless or bad ones and suggested ways to get rid of them. Did you know, for example, that, completely unofficially, the girls from the HR department tell the new girls that if they have any problems with anyone from the office who turns out to be a gigolo and they do not want to file a formal complaint, then they should find and talk to you. This is news to me, but I can remember. Yes, I suspect you can. But Steve, now everyone is afraid to say two words to you. They say you walk around the office like a bear with a sore head. They miss the old Steve with whom they could laugh and joke together. Look, we all understand that you're upset, but living in this damn hotel and never going out, well, it's just not right, at least for you. You need to get out and, well, start dating again. The office is full of eligible women. Oh, Sherry, I think I understand what you're talking about. But weren't you the one who told me that dating co-workers is a bad idea? Besides, we went out today, didn't we? Yes, we went out to dinner, and I invited you to it. Remember? Yes, but who pays in the end? I smiled back at her. Do you see? This is the Steve that the girls in the office miss. A guy who sees the funny side in everything. Even if I'm going to order the most expensive dessert they have on the menu here. Sherry smiled back at me. I understand your point of view, and in the future, I will try to leave personal problems at home. Do something better, Steve. Find yourself a nice apartment or something and go out in the evenings. Even take the risk of asking out some eligible women from the office. Look, I stay away from my work colleagues because, well, sometimes I can look a little cheap when I dress up to go out and have fun. Some Romeos will take this the wrong way and think I'm easy to get. I'm sure you understand what I mean. And as I've told you before, trying to teach the average man how to use a computer program while he's staring at my cleavage usually isn't very successful. I was convinced of this from my own experience. I, of course, objected to Sherry, saying that she could never look cheap, and we both smiled at each other. Then Sherry ordered her dessert. By the way, not the most expensive on the menu. Oddly enough, after that, we talked about Sherry's life and aspirations. I found out that she was 22 years old. To be honest, I always thought she was about 19, which was a little stupid of me. I first met Sherry when we opened the office in Wales, about 18 months ago, and she knew her stuff then. For some reason, maybe the way she dressed, I somehow thought of her as a perpetual teenager. The first time I saw Sherry dressed to go out was the night I was talking about, when she was meeting that young electrician guy in the hotel bar. I drove Sherry to the station so she could catch her train, and she thanked me for the good food and enjoyable evening. Then, getting on the train, she said that someday we will have to do this again. I guess I had to agree with her. The next day at the office, I tried my best to put a smile on my face when I remembered this. And, you know, it must have worked. I noticed that after about a day, people no longer left the tea room as soon as I walked through the threshold, and the people who avoided my table from then on, well, they didn't do that anymore and stopped often to pass the time. That same lunch break... I visited several real estate agents and received a list of furnished apartments for rent locally. I think I was still a little shy about the purchase, and if living in an apartment on my own doesn't work out, I can always go back to the hotel again. Well, I guess that was the thought in the back of my mind. That Thursday, I received an interesting call from Miss Clarkson. How do you like 250000 Steve? Those were the first words she said to me. Sorry, I didn't get it, Miss Clarkson. Copeland... He's obviously not happy with all the press coverage he's getting. This man has something to hide. Either way, things are quiet in the press, and we thought it would be a good time to hint that an alienation of affection case might be on the table soon. I suspect that Constance's legal advisors also made some threats, but I can't know for sure. Be that as it may, Copland's men returned with an offer of 50000 for us to fall behind. We discussed this, and now their offer has increased to 250. We could even squeeze another 25 or so out of these bastards if we pin them against the wall. Go ahead, Miss Clarkson. Take everything you can from this bastard, every last penny. But it is preferable to settle it out of court. 
Constance is not my favorite person in the world at the moment, but the fact that I embarrassed her in court is not something that doesn't affect me at all. Very good, Steve. The press will probably get to it anyway. But you know how it works. The amount must remain secret, which is almost as good as Copland's admission that he... Yeah, okay. For a moment, I was going to use your definition of him. Less than a week later, Miss Clarkson announced that I would be 300,000 pounds richer as soon as I signed where indicated. I went straight to them and left my signature. While I was doing this, Miss Clarkson hinted that Constance might soon buy herself a new house and would probably pay for it in cash. Miss Clarkson was still not sure what grounds Constance had used to frame Copeland, but she suspected it was probably her injuries. A week or so later, I actually moved into a pretty decent apartment. It was further away from my office but had free parking, which was expensive in the area. The apartment was a one-bedroom apartment with a beautiful, large, living, dining area and a surprisingly spacious, well-equipped kitchenette. The bathroom had a washer and dryer, but it was large enough to barely notice them. I don't know if it was the money Copalang put in my bank account or trying to follow. Sherry's advice, but by the end of the month, I was feeling much better and would occasionally go out for drinks after work with some of the guys. There were three of us sitting at the table. Me, my work colleague, who hadn't been with the company very long, maybe a month or so, and Bob, my boss. I was just showing them a spreadsheet I was working on when the computer screen went dark. A second or so later, a terrible blue screen appeared, but it was blank. Then words started appearing in the top left corner, one character at a time. Hey, Steve, guess who is buried here in the depths of hell by playing with the servers? Almost panicking, I quickly started typing, Sherry, I'm in the middle of something important. People are with me. Almost instantly, another message arrived. Oh, sorry, guys. To be honest, this is an unofficial matter. We agreed on today, didn't we? I was surprised when my boss reached past me and started typing, Hi, Sherry. It's Bob. Of course, Steve asks you out this evening. That bastard rarely goes out these days. A response message arrived. Cheers, Bob. Same place. Same hour. Steve. And remember, my train leaves at nine. Then the screen went blank again before my spreadsheet reappeared. Sorry about that, I told my boss. For what, was his answer. Then he added, Dear girl, this Sherry. Our new colleague sat with a confused expression on his face, but finally asked, Who is Sherry? Someone slightly closer to your age than mine, I answered him. Come on, Steve, Bob said. She suits you very well. Lord, you need someone to spice up your life a little. Bob? I'm 12 years older than her. Well, what is 12 years between friends? Jesus, buddy, your mind is too focused on numbers. After that, we went back to doing the calculations in my spreadsheet. By making small changes here and there and figuring out what effect they will have on the end result. I guess it must have been about half an hour when the spreadsheet disappeared again. And another message appeared. Sorry, Steve. Do I need a companion for lunch today? He'll meet you in the waiting room at 12, Bob typed. Thanks, Bob, came the response, and then my spreadsheet reappeared. Will I meet? I asked Bob, probably annoyed that he had twice made an appointment on my behalf. Of course you will meet. This is a request for help, but have you ever refused a lady? No matter who asked, the old Steve would have said yes. Have I really changed that much? No more than could be expected under the circumstances, my friend. But lately we've seen the old Steve slowly come back. Now let's get into these numbers. I quickly realized why Sherry invited me to lunch. She had a colleague, an admirer, I suppose. He was, of course, furious that I had ruined his plans during their lunch break. I would say that he was also disappointed to learn that Sherry and I were having dinner together that evening, and therefore she would not be riding back on the same train with him. Sherry did a good job of keeping her distance from her co-worker. To be honest... I was surprised that he didn't realize it, but perhaps he thought too much of himself and his charms, as some young men tend to do. Later that day, I went into the depths where the company's servers live and spoke quietly with him when Sherry wasn't around. As I walked back to my floor, it occurred to me that 
It had been a long time since I had been forced to have a conversation like this with any of the gigolos in the building. Sherry, when I met her in the reception area, still looked as delightful as she always did after hours. That evening, another guard considered it an honor to carry her briefcase to my car. Sherry said that this co-worker was new to her company, but had known her from college, or rather was fully aware of what Sherry looked like in civilian clothes, as she liked to call it. She also thanked me for everything I said to him that afternoon. That evening, we, or rather Sherry, did a little shopping before grabbing a quick bite at a fast food joint. After walking through all those damn clothing stores, I was feeling pretty exhausted as I put Sherry on her train. Do women really need to try on every piece of clothing that catches their eye? Mind you, I loved watching Sherry come out of the locker room to ask how she looked in what seemed to be shorter and shorter skirts each time. You know, guys, there comes a time when you just have to take the bull by the horns and say that the skirt borders on obscene. So what do women do then? They buy this darkness. You know, if I had figured this out a little earlier, I wouldn't have been so hungry when we finally walked into that fast food place. Over the next six months, my divorce became final and I sort of got used to living on my own. From time to time, I met guys from the office, but most of them were young and looking. Hey, don't think I wasn't looking around because I was. I just couldn't find anyone who, well, piqued my interest. My dates, well, I guess I could call them dates, with Sherry became routine. Don't think there was anything romantic about them, because there wasn't. Sherry told me how her life was going and asked me about what I do in my free time. She often scolded me for not asking this or that lady out on a date when I mentioned them. Sherry seemed to have the idea that if I mentioned a woman, I must be attracted to her, which in a way was probably true, but I couldn't find it in me to start dating again, feeling too old for it. When I told Sherry about this, she started teasing me, calling me old man. The next morning, after Sherry came downstairs, a newspaper headline caught my eye as I walked into the office. It turned out that Copeland had been arrested the day before I bought a copy and tried to read it carefully as I went. As usual, due to jurisdiction laws in the UK, not much was said in the accompanying story. Only that Copeland was arrested and charged with conspiracy and perverting the course of justice. The article went on to list a whole group of other people from around the country who were also arrested. One young lady was charged with multiple counts of perjury. I believe five women, identified as ex-spouses, were arrested and charged with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. The newspaper article mentioned that several other ex-spouses were believed to have fled the country and extradition papers were being prepared as the newspaper went to press. Another seven people were charged with various crimes, including conspiracy and aiding and abetting. Temptingly, the story went on to say that 12 ex-husbands had their divorce agreements overturned. I realize that once the above cases are completed, they will be reevaluated. I can't claim to have followed this story, but the gist of it was that numerous divorce cases across the country involved the same young lady claiming to have had affairs with their husbands and, in one case, with their wife. In each case, the reporter came up with a story very similar to the one my mysterious friend told me all those months ago, and in each case, the settlement involved a fairly large amount of cash. Finally, I saw my mysterious friend again. He was in the background of a news clip on TV. A reporter stood on the steps outside the High Court in London and announced that Copeland and his accomplices had been found guilty of all charges. The next day, Sherry was downstairs. Slightly unusual, it seemed to me, because, as a rule, she came on Thursdays, and today was Tuesday. And what's more, she burst into my department and waved a pair of theater tickets in front of my nose. What are your plans for this evening, Steve? Well, nothing special, really. Okay, you can take me to dinner, and then I'll take you to the show. I must warn you, you will miss your train home. No, I won't be late. There is one that leaves just after midnight. I will sit on it instead of what I was before. Then, after a few seconds, she added, The last bus will leave, but my dad will pick me up from the station. The dinner was good, and the show was good. 
Overall, the evening was great until we got to the station. We both looked at the departure screen, and there were no northbound trains until five in the morning. Sherry walked over to the schedule and cursed. She was mistaken. All the earlier trains left a few minutes after each hour, and the last one, for some reason, left at ten minutes to twelve. Damn, she said. I'll have to stay here overnight. I'll call my old hotel and see if they have a room, I suggested. Oh, don't be stupid, Steve. I'll sleep on your sofa and catch the early train in the morning. Yes, we argued about this topic. No, I didn't see anything wrong with her staying in my apartment if she really wanted to, so we didn't have any arguments about this. We argued about which of us would take the sofa. I tried to play the gentleman. In the end, Sherry trumped all my arguments, insisting that she would rather sleep on a bench on the station platform than force me to leave the bed. Back at the apartment, I found a spare sheet and thought I'd give Sherry my old sleeping bag that I kept in the car as a blanket, just in case. Mind you, I had to put it in the dryer for 20 minutes. It was sitting in the trunk for a very long time. While the dryer worked its magic, Sherry and I had some tea, and she took a good look around my apartment. A couple of times before, Sherry had briefly stuck her nose in it when we brought in frozen food and such that I had bought for the house to put in the freezer. Then, while she was taking a shower, I prepared something on the couch that, in my opinion, should have looked damn uncomfortable. The heated discussion about which of us would sleep here reared its head briefly again, until Sherry repeated her threat to return to the train station. As soon as I took a shower, we said goodnight to each other, and I went to my bedroom. I don't know what time it was when something woke me up. Yes, there was no doubt about it. Someone was blowing gently into my left ear. Sherry? I asked. Yes, Steve? Looks like you're in the wrong bed, young lady. Are you objecting, old man? Or are you simply stating a fact? I'm stating a fact, I guess. Fine. But Sherry? Steve, if you say one word about the 12-year age difference between us, I... Well, we're not going to start our married life without arguing, are we? Married life. Yes, now come on, show what the old man is capable of. I wasn't surprised when Sherry didn't rush to the train first thing that morning, finally realizing that she'd set me up pretty effectively. On the way to the office, Sherry explained that she had been traveling by train for four days to train new employees in the accounting department. In fact, she didn't go home until Sunday evening that week, and she also said that her company had a vacancy for someone to work almost permanently in my company. Of course, not full-time, only three days a week, and it will be very flexible. No problem taking the kids to school or anything like that, Sherry added. Children? I gasped. Of course, I want at least two, and you'll make a great father, Steve. God, then everything is fine? For one terrible minute, I thought you were going to say twelve. See, that's what I like about you. You always see the bright side of everything. We were on our honeymoon. It's that time between sessions when you lie in each other's arms, too excited to sleep, but too exhausted to start again, for now. Sherry, I asked, how long ago did you decide to become my wife? Good question, old man. I guess you could tell when I saw the headlines about your first wife and that Copland guy. Oh, so long ago? Yes. But if you accused me of having a devious nature, you might even question my motives for getting this John guy to pick me up for dinner that night at the particular hotel I chose. I haven't taken my eyes off you for some time now. I'll have to keep an eye on you, won't I? Yes, old man. But don't mistake me for Constance. I know what I want when I see it, and will never do anything that would mean I risk losing it. Well, I mentioned that Sherry and I ran into a very surprised June in Malta, so I guess I should tell you what she told me. June said she believed Constance had a hidden subservient streak that Copland had somehow recognized and tapped into. June noted that after reading the newspapers, she concluded that many of the women involved in his divorce plots appeared to be influenced by the man in some way. I didn't follow the small details of the case, so this was news to me. June said they all seemed to want to take full responsibility for everything, even though the only one involved in every single case was Copeland. I don't know what this man has going for him, but he can wrap some women around his little finger, June told me. But Constance turned on Copland and sued him, didn't she? I made an observation. 
Constance is my little sister, Steve. I've always taken care of her. And maybe it's my own fault. Perhaps Constance has always been subject to my wishes. I pushed her into this trial. I believe she would not have had the courage to see it through to completion if I had not done so. Fortunately, Copeland gave in and settled the case out of court. I don't know how Constance would have reacted if they had confronted each other in the courtroom. By the way, is this your new bride, Steve? Certainly. Sherry chased me and caught me. She made a very good choice. June smiled back at me. Life goes on. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.